Welcome, Welcome from Alpha, from Alpha to, Omega. to Omega. Hello, and welcome to the 76th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Tuesday, 24th of January 2017, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week, I'm delighted to welcome back C. Derek Varon to the show. Derek last appeared on the show on the Donald Trump election special. I got quite a bit of feedback on that show, with a number of requests to get Derek back on the pod to set him straight on MMT. What starts out as a feisty affair eventually settles down into a Marxist lovin', where we end up essentially agreeing about everything and decide to get married. But before all of the romance, first I have a few people to thank. The once-off donation of Michael T and all the monthly subscribers. Much appreciated all. Must also thank the new YouTube subscribers. Stefan Hamill, Phil Hall, Barney Doherty, Ambrose Andrew, Znalo, Paolo Enrique, Adela Smith, Derek Farn, the man himself, Sherato, the Antichrist ZD, and Eric Silver. Also, if you would like to leave a comment on the show, please try and leave them on the YouTube episode. The Podomatic comments don't notify people if their comments have received any replies. I usually try to reply to people, sometimes at length, but they never get to know about it. So if you want to comment, head over to the YouTube video of the show and leave your comments there instead. I've also decided not to use any copyrighted music on the show anymore, which is a pity as I love editing in any cool music that I come across. But the problem is YouTube slap a whole load of ads all over the episode if I do that. And I don't want to ruin it for the listeners or make any extra cash for YouTube off my back. For some reason, the Sunra tracks I currently use are so obscure that not even the internet knows about them. So, if you want to comment, head over to YouTube. And of course, please like, subscribe, share, tweet or leave a review for the show over on iTunes. It really helps spread the word. Okay, to the interview. So Derek, we last talked on the day, I think, of Donald Trump's election. We did a a live special with myself, yourself and Doug. And I got a few requests for uh, a show where uh, me and you talk about MMT. The few listeners had uh, given out about you. They said, hey, you can't let him just shout down at you. And I, I, I understand that you had a few request opposite side as well yes to defeat the heretic so to speak so um yeah the, the the general discussion is we needed to actually go into this in some detail and talk about where the differences may be so i come at this as a marxist and a value theorist and i think you're coming at it from a, a similar point of view but we don't agree on certain topics but maybe today we can either get to closely examine where we disagree and let maybe the listeners decide on what they think of those or maybe we might come to some better understanding of each other so i suppose what i was hoping to do is probably to start from first principles i know we we use the phrase mmt i kind of like just from now on just kind of call it money yeah so let's start there with with money now money to me is the thing that can take many different forms i think also historically it looks like that you know it doesn't have one simple origin I would agree. So traditionally, when we read, say, Das Capital, Marx is always going on about commodity money. So he talks a lot about the labor theory value and how it works with gold. Right. In in, in volume one and two, he actually talks about credit money in volume three. And he talks about gold being an arbitrary commodity fetish in the economic manuscripts of 1844. It's strange. You know, I think that probably he, at his time... You know, money was more understand of as a, as a commodity. Now, I've done read a quite a lot of stuff on on the origins of money and anthropology of stuff. Like, and one thing that comes out as well is that this idea of money being as a commodity was was mostly used in scenarios where, say, if you had two tribes that were trading and they really didn't trust each other that much. What what they would use is they would use uh, money as a hard currency, a gold or a silver or something like that, 
because it's a kind of a universal thing that they both know what they think its value is. Yeah, relative to each other. Relative to each other. So, you know, it, 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 there's a safety there. You're getting your gold. You know, it, it's not like a paper currency where we don't have a shared, say, a large state to do it. So there's like, it's a safety. It's like an insurance mechanism on that transaction. Yeah, yes. And again, I, I don't think there's anything non-Marxist about that. If I may, I will read some Marx from our Hurley scripter. This is not this is not fair. You're come prepared. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm coming prepared, but I'm not. So far, we are in not we are in disagreement at all. So, as against this, the commodity form and the value relation of the of the products of labor within which it appears have absolutely no connection with the physical nature of the commodity and the material relations arising out of this. It is nothing but the definite social relations between men themselves, which assumes here for them the fantastic form of the relation between things. In order, therefore, to find an analogy, we must take flight into the misty realm of religion. The product of the human brain appears as an anonymous figure endowed with life on their own, which enter into the relations both between each other and the human race. So it is the world of commodities with the products of men's hands. I call this fetishism which attaches itself to the products of labor as soon as they are produced as commodities and therefore are inseparable from the production of commodities. Now, let's paraphrase that. Let's paraphrase that and make break it down to English. So, so basically, that money is produced as commodities, but these commodities get more and more abstract, and they are obscuring human relations. Money, in specific, is a late development of the, com- of the commodity form. And in the, I'm not just talking about fiat currency or credit money, as Marx would call it. I'm talking about any form of consistent money. There would have been no need for explicit systems of like formalized barter within tribal societies because th- th- those were seen as kind of communal anyway. Um, the only time that you had trade developing would have been, which again, I completely agree. I think the anthropology completely backs this up. If you read Marshall Solon's Stone Age Economics, which goes into this into, in detail, that seems very clear that markets exist only between groups, not within them, because within them there's no need for them because of primitive allocation resources. Now, I want to get to the point that a lot of people miss, because I think this is where people think that Marx is only talking about gold. I have one thing to say before you say there, just when Marx talks about uh, fiat currency as credit money, I think that that's, a, that's a mistake straight off, that I, I think that there is a difference between fiat and credit we, we will, but there are two forms of credit money, credit to an individual and then credit, to, credit through the state, which are different kinds of credit money. But no, I think there's a, a difference there because when, when, a, when a state creates a money, when the, state, when the U.S. Treasury or the Bank of England or the ECB or whatever bank you want to take, the central bank, when they say print up a hundred pound notes or a 50 euro note, there's no credit on that. Right. They can't default. There's, there's nobody owed. It's just printed up, okay? It's only loaned to banks. No, no, it's not loaned at all. You can print it up. When the state prints up that money, they don't owe anybody anything for that money, okay? Now, there's a very distinct difference between that and when I, as a person, go into a bank and get a loan. I think, I think you're just, like, actually factually wrong. Well, explain why, why they owe somebody. Okay. When the state prints money, which it actually, in the case of the United States, doesn't do. It does. It prints up dollars. No, it doesn't. The Fed is not part of the, sta- the, Fed is not part of the state. The, look, like the, we're talking about first principles. You know, if you want to, we can talk about the bank. Well, yeah, but you, 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 you know, oh, yeah, we're, we're, okay. we're, we're not talking we're, about specific ones and the ownership, whether it's owned by this, that, or the other person. We're talking about... How does that money get into circulation? Can the government just put it there? Yes. No. Yes. How? How? Well, they can do it any way they want. They can. They could literally. They can so th- exchange it for labor, but it's only valuable in exchange for labor in which it can buy something, which means it is worth what a labor can procure it. It's not just created, or it has no value. Well, this is a separate issue. So we're going to. These two are very linked, and this is, I think, the key of our misunderstanding. Well, yeah. I mean, if you mean the physical currency, when you're talking, and, and this, we need to be very careful here. Because money has three functions, and which currency, which is the liquidity form, is a function. You can print up as much of it as you want to, and it's going to be relative to any number of separate 
of separate issues. And yes, you can use it to pay for services in which the government can put it in circulation. I don't think I've never known of a government anywhere on earth to just drop it. Post 9-11, pretty much exactly what George Bush did when he gave a tax rebate. But let's not get into there. That gets into the, the complicated functionings of it. But let's just talk about this first principle. Say I am the Bank of England, prints up £20 notes, okay? Mm -hmm. And it distributes them into the economy, okay? Right. Whatever man method it does or whatever, there is no debt associated with that note when it prints up that, pound, that £20 note. It doesn't owe anybody any money for doing it. Okay? So there's a very big difference between the bank of central bank or its equivalent, whatever structure, whether it's the treasury in a different setup or whatever, prints that £20 note and a bank that creates £20 of credit money and puts it in your account when you get a loan. Because the £20 that a bank creates, that is basically... A bookkeeping exercise whereby, you know, you still have to pay the bank back that amount of money with interest before that bank can balance its books. One is a credit money and then the other one is just a fiat money where it's just created and, and, sp and spent. This to me is an amazingly important distinction between the two types of money. OK, so when Marx talks about credit money, he's talking about banks creating money through loans. Right. Also talking about states creating money through loans, but but states can create money through loans. That that again, another is a is a tricky. That, that is a third with. separate category. Well, I mean, it's you, you you have fiat money, which if we're going to separate out, if 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 a government distributes it directly in the form of stimulus payment, tax rebate, or um, infrastructure investment where there was no prior value. That you can increase the currency supply, which increases liquidity, which does produce physical money. And yes, there is nothing owed to that, but that is decoupled from that money's value. You know, any kind of paper print up a twenty pound note in a Marxist sense of value, the only value that that note has is the amount of labor it took to create that note. Right. It, so it might cost a half a penny. It, it, social, its social functioning as abstract value is separate from its labor value. And what I was going to read to you about Marx actually talks about that, right? I, what, what, my only point in bringing that up is there's a lot of Marxists who will argue against um, MMT by basically saying that fiat money isn't money. Yeah, well, that's a kind of a very stupid thing, I think. Let's lay down what the three functions of money are because we haven't actually said it. So we have liquidity, which is the rapidity in which you can move assets around as a store of value and as an exchange of value and the difference between abstract and use value specifically in Marxism. All right. Um, there is no reason to assume that even though that would always be relative to both labor theory of value and to the overall production in the system, that it would be gold. Gold is just easy historically as it developed because people assumed that it had equal value. But Marx actually writes about times when in the new world where that wasn't the case because gold had a completely different social use its use value was different so it's so its relationship to wants were different and the ease of getting it was different because of its closeness to the ground and so when european societies encountered the societies they had no idea what to do with them i mean marx wasn't a gold fetishist in that sense he could see clearly from the history of the new world that gold was kind of a historical accident only because it's relatively hard use value to procure i mean relatively hard labor value to procure and it's limited immediate use value that all makes sense. But uh, one thing that I think people get kind of caught up on is this idea of what you were saying earlier of not being money at all. And I, I think that's kind of a misunderstanding right. of what money's role is in a capitalist society. Money's been used at different times in different ways. So one, right. one famous example is, say, in the British imperialism, they use a hut tax in, in place like South Africa, where... They create a tax for every hut and say you've got to pay us a £10 a month or whatever in tax. Now, in that scenario, the British government or the colonial government or whatever you want to call it, it prints the money. So it doesn't need money because it can print up as much money as it wants if it just needs pounds. Right. Although, didn't, didn't it actually still relate it to a commodity when it started doing that? Um, who knows? It might have been gold-backed at the time because it was a British one was gold-backed in Europe. But that's 
that's got lots but, of historical things to do with it and right. it also has got class relations whether it's gold back or not so let's not just get into that just let's just talk about what what the create currency to make people it, it itself creates a debt it is not exactly, and what, what is the, yeah, and what is the function of the British government? Because they do, obviously don't want those pounds, they, you know, because they can get them any other right. way they wanted. So what they actually are doing by this is they're creating a need for that extrapolating person. labor, extrapolating labor, exactly. So in here we see in this scenario that it is money is being printed. Yeah, essentially, it'll be printed by the government because they'll have to they'll have to print it to, to allow the other people to get their hands on it. So we have the mm -hmm. government printing money so as to extract labor from the people that they're over. So, right. So it, it forces exchange of value. It, it forces, well, it, it forces labor really is what it does. You know, yeah, it, right. it, it forces that person force to, to do right. what Marx would call socially, you know, useful or whatever labor, a labor that the, the ruling class thinks is worthy, whether it's building a dam or building a railway or whatever the hell it is. So in that instance, it's social, but it's socially useful for someone else. Well, yeah, but, yeah. Whoever's <laughs> in charge, you know, whoever runs the society decides what is socially useful. So in that, right. in that scenario, there you've got a guy printing up the money. The money means nothing, but it's the social relation of that money that allows that money to actually represent a true value. Right. A different form of fetish. And all I'm doing is like explaining how the categories that Marx established could explain all this already. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but I think there's an important thing to understand there that that this is the way I understand it, and I think it's correct. Is that when when a state or whoever has got the power to create a currency and get it accepted, there is no problem with that if it's able to draw labor to back what it's adding into the equation. Right. As long as as long as you exist within an autarkic production situation so like that works in south africa because they literally took it over once you are subject to a sovereign nation you are subject to money within that nation the, the where where and so like what i was what i agree to like if you to, to talk about the functions of money where where you're right one fiat currency is created by the government it is a form of money in that it represents it creates liquidity it can be used as a store of value, although it's not always that useful for that. And it has exchange. It is a it is exchangeable for value. So the other thing I would say as well, Derek, is that it's intrinsically linked to the power of the state. You know, and that, like that power. Like, that's not true. That's only true in that form of money, though. Yeah, that's not yeah, true. That's for I agree. It's not true okay. for, but like, it's not true for a gold coin because you have a gold coin. It's a gold coin. But right. when it when it comes to like whether a, a currency is gold backed or not, go, or, or say a gold backed currency. But look, that's all bullshit. Every gold backed currency in the history of society of history of man has has, has ended up going to fiat currency when it wants to. So there's no gold. There's no gold standard that's still a gold standard. So you know, basically, I, I want I want you to prove that because this is like. Name a country There's no go back currency back. now. There's no, nobody. No, nobody. The last one but, I think but, was Switzerland in 1999 or something. But, but most currency, most most small governments do have reserves to back their currency. They do have gold reserves, they, but they're not gold backed. No, 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 no. No, they don't have gold reserves. A lot of, no, <laughs> they have. They have. They have foreign currency reserves. And they have gold reserves. Nearly every what, state in the world will actually still have gold reserves. Yeah, sure, but not not enough to do anything. Not not of any significance. I mean, you, also a lot of currencies are also really reserved uh, reserved by petrodollars. But there's not enough. I mean, petro, not petrodollars by by oil. But there's not enough of that either to to serve for. Well, like remember the thing is that like when we say backed, none of these dollars are petrol backed. None of them. They they don't say you can get a barrel of oil for this petrol. We pegged it at twenty two dollars right. a barrel. But the power, like, but everything has a value. But that's a different thing as to saying it's backed. All right, be, the the ability to use force to I'm trying to figure out how to explain this in a way that can make it work with liberty of value. Um, I'm trying to give you the, the most charitable reading possible. The force relations of a state are fetishized in the currency. There we go. Yeah, I would say that's a right. I think that's correct. I don't know if it's fetishized, but the the 
the, the force relations of it, whatever power that has the ability to print that money, it's not the power that creates the value of the currency, but it's it's the the power of whatever ruling class or state that allows this current this currency as opposed to a different one to draw value. Right. Yeah. So there's a distinction there. But so so when when we come then to say let's look at two different governments. Let's look at say the Greek government, or you can take the Irish government, say for example, who are using who are using the euro and they don't have fiat power over the euro. Okay. And let's look at Japan as a counterexample, okay? And Japan have, you know, what is it now? I don't know, but is it 250% of GDP of government debt? And you've got a place like Ireland where they've got 90% or whatever. Look at the price of their government bonds. In Japan, the government bond is essentially at 0% interest, right? And in Ireland, when it spiked, it went up to, I don't know what actually it went up to in Ireland, like 7 or 8, 10%. Right. And and what we see here is that one country gave up its power to control the currency when it went into the euro. So it can't print its money when it wants. It can't set the price, it set the, their own interest rate. It can't make their own government bonds in their own currency. And one can. Yeah. So when we see that when you can, everybody knows Japan can never default because they can print up. They can just buy the currency. They can buy the debt. The debt is really in effect, just a type of a currency with a bit of an interest rate on it. It's like saying a $100 note with a 1% interest coupon. That's what a government debt is and when you've got a fiat society. So we see in the real world very, very different outcomes for countries that maintain this financial power, whatever yeah. way you want to describe it. But, but both are low growth, but what one has to offset, uh, offset austerity measures more than the other. It actually is irrelevant. To, to some claims by MMT, because the, the claim is the power of the state can force value into the system by forcing production and can do so at zero interest as a natural, as a natural inclination. And by doing that, it can create perpetual full employment. Yes, and I think that's correct. I think that's bullshit. Well, There's that's... no example of it on Earth. There has been... Lots of no, it hasn't. There's have never done... been one that's lasted for more than a year. I can go through every single example you've ever given and tell you where it died out after 10 years. And not because of exchange of monetary policy. Okay, because well... there's a limit to how much productive value there is there. And this is why MMT is wrong. No, well, let's listen. Let's, let, no, well, let's, let, let's calm down now and let's think about it, right? Let's say you've got a, company, a country that has... Um, what you haven't explained is how international trade works. You have assumed that, now, that the entire world works on a government government autarchy. I'm not calming down. You're wrong. <laughs> like, the, no, like there's, there's like five there's like five hidden assumptions because what I did is agreed to you in three premises and then we accelerated the three more. And what I'm trying to tell you is I agree with fiat currency is a thing. I think it developed out of credit currency. Um, I think that's an objective fact. I agree with you when I really think about it. It is not the same thing as credit currency because it can be injected directly. It creates debt. Again, we agree with that too. What fiat currency? Well, no, no. I I think that that's I don't. Fiat currency doesn't create debt. Like it, cre it, it, well, can, it, it can it can create a government debt, which is not really a debt. But MMT's claim that its ability to enforce to force a currency is based on the power of taxation, which is a debt. Is it not? Yes, but like what we're saying here is that, see, if a, if the U.S. government borrows money in dollars, it's not really a debt. It's a way. It's the equivalent of printing money and spending it into the economy. It's the equivalent action. But if a go U.S. government or say the Irish government borrowed euros, then that's a proper debt because we can't we don't have control over the euros. So we have to get those euros in trade. So there's a, a distinct difference between those two actions, okay? But but you but you still I, I want to hear your your, your theory of how this works internationally because I, I actually let's before we get kind of all caught up in the international let's just talk a little bit to step back one tiny bit to first principles. All right. Now, what's the unemployment rate say in the U.S. right now? About the true one or the book one? The book one's about five. The true one's about. 10. Yeah, well, let's say it's 10%, okay, for ease of use. Now, in the morning, the US government 
no problems if it wanted to, could pay all those people. It could come up with a series of works that it wanted done and it could pay those people a decent wage and just print that money. And once those people in the US were creating things that the society deemed were of value, and by the society we usually mean the ruling people who, who choose what's valuable. Why does hyperinflation ever happen in any state? Yeah, well, hyperinflation happens, well, usually when the power of the government in question has come basically under scrutiny and people stop believing in that power. That's normally what happens. Usually that happens post-war. The logical implication of this, one, is that the economy can be managed in perpetuity at full employment by the power, by, by the power of the state, which is basically by the power of arms. You don't believe in labor theory of value anymore, anymore if you believe that. I do believe in the labor theory of value. How? How? Well, this is where it gets very complicated for me, Derek. Yeah? Like, I believe that that... But let's think about it from a, from a labor theory of value point. We, when, we did, when, we discussed, okay. when we discussed that hood tax example, we had no problem with it. Because that money ended up representing a value. Yeah? And in America today, it's the same thing. No, no, you're right. You're right. But you still have to stay within, within a system of a toxic dominance. Sorry, what do you mean by that? Say again. So, like, you have to be able to, to set the terms of exchange generally through taxation, and the only way you can set the terms of exchange through taxation is through arms. If that alone was enough to make capitalism work, feudalism should have worked the way capitalism did, because that did the same thing. You know, it did, would be a different society, you know. Like, think about it, Derek. Like, we had places like Australia that ran 1% unemployment for, like, 40 years. Yeah? It was a state policy. Now their state policy is to run at 6%. The state policy, this 6% is not, there's no underlying real reason for it. That 6%, and the same that it represents in Europe or in, in whatever that percentage is taken, that represents a decision. This is the way I understand it. It represents a decision by the, the ruling class to determine what the power of the working class is going to be. I think that's false. I think it represents what they have to do in an international market where their autonomic values don't matter. Well, I think there's definitely some of that in it. There's definitely things where things change, like the the the, the, the rate of profit goes low. You know, it, right? I mean, like, and and that's and that wouldn't show up internally; it would show up externally. This is where personally it gets extremely confusing, right? So let me just lay that out there. Well, I mean, this this, this is where like. This is actually the issue of debate because I will grant you all three, all three of the initial conditions that you've given. And I will even correct myself on stating that fiat money is a form of credit money, even though I do think it has a relationship to debt in one direction or the other. It, you're right. It can just be created. It's creation, it's, it's creation is dependent on the value that it can be s said to have by, the, by being forced to pay in it. Yeah, and the labor it brings forth, because I think that's an amazing point. Right. That, that it actually, this relation gets people to do work. It coerces people to do shit. Right. You're completely right. And it does so by what we, and Marxists has talked fetishization, because it, it, it hides the character of the relationship. All right. And this is, this is why it's different from feudalism, because in feudalism, there's nothing hide the fact that your wealth is being extrapol extrapolated from you. And to be fair, I normally don't like malice, but malice actually have done good work on this. So the people who talked about primi um, partial primitive accumulation continuing in imperial, in, in imperial development, you know, and MMTers have talked a little bit about it too, because it's relevant to their theory of money creation. Now, we have also granted, though, that most MMTers don't, that this is not the only possible form of money. No, there are different types. Right. We have also granted... This is where things get confusing, and this is where I think the limit to MMT as a way to fix capitalism is why you can't just advocate for it as a fixed capitalism. Yeah, like I don't know if it's going to fix capitalism, but you see, if we talk about what a, how a Marxist understands credit money, okay, and I think they're right in how they understand credit money, okay, that say somebody mm -hmm. like Andrew Kleiman will say that credit money is able to disguise the underlying problems of the value. So when we keep, when the banks keep on creating credit money for people to buy houses and there's a housing bubble and they keep pumping money into there that 
this will actually disguise what really the true value of that house is in in our in Dublin or in Cork or wherever in the country. It's the banks throwing this money at it, and then suddenly something will happen elsewhere in the economy, and people will come to the realization that Jesus, those houses and estates they built up on the side of that mountain in County Leintrim, they're you know they're worthless. No one is ever going to live there, and that what happened there is that the credit money that was created there that's never now going to get the labor too much of it was created it's never going to have the labor draw the value to to back it in the right way right that that, that it has neither abstract value or use value once it happens yeah it, it goes down and then basically that that thing is it's got it's worth an awful lot less whether its use value goes down or and its abstract value goes down whatever the hell it's totally functions like that so like we see the 2008 right. crisis all this credit money People just realized, actually, you know, that was a charade that that will never be worth what we what what the market was saying it was worth at that point. So, OK, there's a couple of things here that you're right. So we got that. And then fiat money isn't the same. It's not the same. But fiat money, at least in the case of China, did something very similar. In that it created a whole lot of stuff that couldn't be used for whatever reason. Some of it actually is China's own internal policy. I don't, that's, a, that's a completely different question. And I'm neither pro nor anti-China, particularly as a capitalist power, but it does have internal passport system. But it created all these buildings, and then a lot of them could not be used. So the productive capacity began to die down. Now, you can say, okay, that this is, that is a problem of misuse of policy which somebody like, I think, Minsky would probably say. Are we agreeing still? Yeah, I think it's undeniably a misuse, you know, but like... Right, yeah. right. I mean, but someone like Ray would say that, that, that just the, the, the currency being injected into the system should, should fix that. And I think someone like Minsky, again, a very similar figure to MMT, would actually disagree. So I'm, I'm bringing this up because I don't even think MMT is clear it has a consensus within itself in, in neo-Keynesian economics about what happens when that happens with fiat currency. All right. And the, the historical examples that I've read about Japan, Brazil, Turkey, and Japan and China, they actually all do different things. Chi- China has an acceleration and then a slowdown. Japan has a slowdown, but does maintain fairly high employment levels compared to its economic growth. And, uh, Brazil actually loses value somehow. I'm, and I'm still trying to figure that out. Like, I was just looking at raw numbers. What I would say is when you get looking at the, all these different countries and all, the, all the, and trying to compare them, remember, that is such a complex system that there are all so many different things happening at the same time. You know, this balance of payments crisis, currency different. Pri- you know, there's so many things going on. It's very hard to, to take out that noise, you know, about what the effect of that thing is. But what's undeniable is that any country, any any government in the world can maintain full employment if they want to, if they control their currency. To me, that's just undeniable. Right now, whether that country will get richer or poorer or how it will do in international trade is it's kind of like another separate thing. OK, so 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 what we are granting then is one element of MMP and not another. So you are granting that full employment can be procured by by liquidity. Basically, by having enough stuff constantly moving in the system, there's got to be people doing stuff. Print money, whatever, government debt, spend it into the economy. It creates bus- you know, businesses which may or may not create jobs, but it all keeps money flowing. That Someone's got either employment or a shop. Okay, we got that. But what we are saying separately is the wealth of that country could go up or down based on something else. Of course it could, yeah. Which would be, it's relative in, to international value. Okay, so, breaking down, this is actually where my difference with MMT, I don't know if it's my difference with you, this is my, this is when I was going out to with MMT. I think part of the reasons why they adjust the employment rate is, is not just out of, out of like making the working class weaker, although that's part of it. But it's also because of the decline of the rate, the tendency of the rates of profits to fall, even in such a system. This is true. I don't know that I think can get us out of that. 
that's my bigger point. Well, you see, I think they can get countries out of that. I think they can in short term, but not in long term. And this is where we, we, we had this debate. Like, I don't think you can potentially do it because y- your your ability to trade your currency in the international market would decline with your wealth because your wealth would equal would be tied to your you're available to enforce that currency. But here's here's what I would say, Derek, is that like when when we see a big financial crisis like in 2008, uh, 2009, you see that they they interviewed Ben Bernanke and Ben Bernanke created a trillion dollars and put into these different banks. And in the interview, he was asked, where did you get that money from? And you know what he said? You just make it. I just typed it up on the keyboards. Yeah, it's just like that. It's just you can do it on a computer. He was like, yeah, it's totally obvious. But now let's think about what that meant. Like that means that like in that situation, you had a class that was going to lose an awful lot of money. And what happened? The power of the purse was used to create money in certain ways to defend that class. Now, in the morning, let's say the entire US economy got an average profit of 2% or something like this, right? Let's say it's in the 70s and everything's gone to shit. The rate of profit is down to 2%. I think it was actually negative in Britain at one stage. At one point, it was like negative four percent, actually. Yeah, yeah, it was in England too. And let's say, say, say it was down at that negative percent, right? At that time, right, the government could go to every company that was making a loss, and it could print up a load of money to buy a load of their goods to make sure that they were in profit, and it could put those goods to whatever use it wanted. Okay. As long as that money could still purchase things outside of the country to make the necessary goods. That is the key caveat because you can't just do that. Like that's when real value exchanges come up, which is why. Exactly. So this, this is what I think determines the relative prices of these currencies against each other. Now, but let's just, for example, assume we had, (laughs) you know, one of these uh, new world order ideas of, you know, one world government or whatever, right? We had a one government in controlling the whole world and it was capitalist. Okay. And the rate of profit was minus 4%, right? And international trade doesn't really mean anything. The state of the currency doesn't mean anything. They would be able to buy up enough goods from all these companies to keep them afloat and do with whatever the hell the government wanted to do with those goods, okay? And it could do that in perpetuity, okay? Because when they create this fiat currency, there's no debt associated with it like there is when there is a bank. So the country would actually end up becoming more and more like the bloody communist countries, you know, where you've got God's plan deciding what to buy and where to put them. There is this function of the currency within a capitalist economy, which kind of is like the war economy or like a, an old state socialist economy. So that, that there is a possibility. Here's the thing. You're focusing on two of the three functions of currency, though. Because if you do that, there's, there's no need for it to be a store of value separate from its labor value in a world system like that. And once you hit that point... I'm not sure we're talking about capitalism anymore. Well, there would, um, be a maybe... store, there would be a store of value in it because the store of value would be what, what average amount of labor that dollar or whatever is able right. to draw out. And that would be the value. So you might have two different countries. You have the U- Say there's only two countries in the world. There's UK and the US. And they're both doing, basically, deciding the government bailing out all the companies, right? They're both doing exactly the same policies. Now... The value of the relative value of their currencies to each other would be determined by which of those on average is able to get more labor and more productive labor. Right. Agreed. And so then the price of those currencies relative to each other will fluctuate based on which country is being more efficient or whatever the hell, you know. And right. so that's our way to understand it. Like the main reason why, like if we, if we look at how neoliberalism actually ended up working its way out but the big problem was there is that like to me personally how i think about it is that there was a massive inflation at the same time as there was a problem with the rate of profit you know you had that oil oil calamities at the time right and when they spent money into the economy to keep it going it drove inflation wild and they were left in a bind you know they had to either do one or the other and they decided to control the inflation in a certain way now the 
the issue that I'm gonna there's one more issue that I have that I still think is a big one. How does hoarding affect this? I don't know. What do you mean? Like how? Why hoarding, which is a, a product of the st of the store of value. This is this is you know there's an equation for it, and Mar I actually don't remember, but Marx's capital too. To me, this seems to assume that first off, there's one world government or two world governments. So we we no longer have. That's just for that's only for trying to understand this. Right, so. right, right. Uh, no, no. I, I I'm assuming this for the thought experiment. All right. I'm not saying that's true. Uh, There's only one world government. It's the UN, and they're putting fluoride in our water. <laughs> All right. Um, see, I knew you were secretly a right winger. No. Um, <laughs> What's right wing about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> nothing. Totally. I didn't anything that John Birch Society has said. So, <laughs> uh, anyhow, there's two things that seem to tie me up about this, but. I, I can concede to you that if we factor out the world market where forces, where forces real value things to be shown in a different way, if we factor that out with the thought experiment, this could work with the exception of the instability caused by declining resources, which seems like it'd be a big damn problem, which we can call the natural limit, or spooks from perception of the declining resources, which would tend to, to encourage people to over-favor the store of value function of currency, which would lead to hoarding. And I'm assuming it would be natural, cause, natural events causing this because at this point there isn't enough governments to, you know, governments and government force to spook that out. To me, like, absolutely the problem with this is that, you know, I think that capitalism mean, has within itself the seeds to last as long as it wants. You, you know what I oh, mean? Uh, agreed. I, I don't believe. I don't believe in final crisis theory. You know, it can do it either way. It can either go for a, a big collapse and reboot the, the rate of profit that way, or it can manage the rate of profit and it be, it can become more and more centralized through the state or through whatever other mechanism allows this to function, using the money to choose the winners and the losers. So, like that can definitely go on in perpetuity. But the one thing that it can't get past is like, say, you run out of oil. Say your food stock goes down or, you know, the, all, all, these ones that are natural limits. And once they start trying to, you know, print the money the same way as they were before, they're just going to drive inflation because you're not going to be able to create the same amount of goods. And to be honest with you, we're coming close to those limits. Right. So that is why you actually aren't. An, OK, so I'm, I'm tr I've been trying to understand for years, literally years at this point, how you claim to believe this. And almost made it sound good, but we're still a communist, and I think I just figured it out. So, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a proponent of MMT, right? As in, I don't think that right. it's the solution. But I, you know, but you, you, you do think it would, it would be a solution to unemployment. I think it's a solution to capitalism's problems until the, until it runs out of everything. If you know what I mean. If they want to keep capitalism, ticking, so it would actually make capitalism worse. <laughs> Well, Go ahead. Then, yeah, like, you know, it'll probably lead to capitalism not being as productive, I would imagine, because the one thing that, you know, that the free market does is it drives productivity. But you can imagine if you're just picking win, if you're just all these kind of failing companies and you're buying them and you're keeping them in business, it's going to remove some of that drive to remain competitive. So it would probably lead to capitalism stagnating and not being as productive as it would be if it. If it let, if it didn't do these, you know. So I think that we're trying to understand it from a, how the system actually can work and does work under crisis, because every country un, under war conditions goes full on MMT, yeah. And well, afterwards, afterwards they turn it off because you know when people realize actual how it works, people realize oh we could do it, we could actually use this in a positive light, you know, to change our world. You know, it could be used that way, you know. But uh, they don't want people to know what how money actually operates. But it's still no panacea. I, I... It's still no panacea because what you really want to get to is a is a steady state economy, and I don't know how that would operate through MMT. Right, like feudalism, but not a sh not a shitty, yeah, a high pro highly productive steady state. And also, you want a communist society, you know. And if you had it in communist society, you don't need MMT. You just have a different way of organizing your production. But we like as leftists, we've got to understand what capitalism is capable of 
if we're going to organize. So your 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 contention with someone like Kleiman is different than your contention with someone like me. My contention with you is that I agree with you like 80% of the way until you start throwing in international markets. If you remove international markets from the equation, I can concede most of your points. But my, my points are that there's a natural limit to that. And you would agree too, that this cannot overcome in and of itself resource constraints and actually wouldn't really have the incentives to because it would be a, it would be a less efficient form of capitalism. It's a way of, it's a just a, a set, you know, like there are different ways you could manage capitalism and this is definitely one. And, you know, like I think we, I think we agreed on how it happened if you had two countries working, you know. Yeah, you it, would, it could still happen. It, it could still, still happen. happen. And if every country in the world used MMT and a full employment problems, you'd still have currency fluctuations and one getting richer, one country getting richer than the other, you know, because one country would be becoming more productive than the other just naturally through different policies or whatever the hell they were using. So all it would mean is that the way that, that the in global in capitalist system actually interacted would be different, but it would still be capitalist, right? And it would still, ha you know, it would be slightly different in its functioning, but there are lots of different types of capitalism since it existed different ways of functioning so like for me we got to understand it like particularly the day that's in it yesterday we had the inauguration this is right we were recording this on saturday we had uh, donald trump being inaugurated is that the right word inaugurated inaugurated, yeah, inaugurated. inaugurated. As, yeah what am i saying as, as, as a temporal god emperor no as um, our, as as our, as our yes. yeah as our lord and master and uh ruler of our dominion <laughs> Uh, but he and a very attractive man he is too. Uh, but he, uh, do you know what? I've been watching some old boxing matches. I'm a big boxing fan, and I'm watching like ones from like the '80s. And like sitting in the front row in the back, who do you see? Like, because it's in one of his casinos, you see Donald Trump there, and it's like Jesus, the bastard is right. everywhere. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, he, yeah, he, I was uh, actually watching a, a, a philosophy something from 1989 by a Marxist, and they mentioned him, and I'm like, man, this is this he's been around for a while. <laughs> yeah. He's got he's got he's got his uh, tentacles everywhere. But um, but watch what Donald Trump said. One of the first things he did in his inauguration speech was he mentioned about building the infrastructure back up of America. Like, and I know you've been abroad a lot, Derek. You you know how shitty American infrastructure is now compared to say European. Right, and European infrastructure is shitty compared to Asian. I mean, yeah, yeah, you know. Well, it depends where you are in Europe. Some of Europe is good, but like some of it's not great. But but. But like American infrastructure is a, a fellow who's traveled around America is really poor. Oh, it's bad. It. Bad. Like the, the roads are shit. The bridges are fucked. You know, the the trains are useless. The what trains? If you're out of, <laughs> yeah. we use trucks for everything. If you're out of, you know, I, I live in, you know, I've lived in kind of developing world circumstances for a while. And there are parts of the United States that aren't that much better didn't say parts of North Africa. <laughs> so, you know, that yes, you're right. We don't disagree there. I think there's a limit to how much you could build specifically with that. But right now, you could do a whole lot. Yeah. And D Donald Trump has come in and like and said, well, the first thing really he mentioned nearly in his whole speech was we're going to rebuild our infrastructure, do our roads, blah, 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 blah. And also, like a day before that or two days before that, there was an interview where he says we can't default on our own currency because we, we can just print it. He was basically right. chiming MMT stuff. And, and and Steve Bannon is a professed is a professed Neo Kanian yeah. too. His, and, and, his and, chief staff. And and also then look at say people like you know MMTers don't want to talk about it. Look at what Hitler did. He did exactly the same thing. The history of strong men. And these guys coming in is that they're not like populist strongmen. Take that with a pinch of salt. I don't know if Hitler was a populist, but they are fascist, whatever you want to say. They use the power of the state to create money and they use it to drive down unemployment, get the men working, build up the infrastructure of the country. They'll do military Keynesianism. Although they also use slave labor. Yes, slave labor. Like... Yeah, everything, you know. But people on the left have to have their eyes open to what are the chances that Donald Trump is going to make this work? And that's the big fear. The, the actual real dangers of Trump, if he's going to do what he says, who knows what he's going to do what he says. But if he actually does this stuff, you know, you're going to end up probably with an eight-year Trump presidency and it, it could go worse than that. 
Right, and, and furthermore, like, they're basically hoping that their arch nemesis, neoliberal Republicans in specific, will save them. Now, and, and then you and I agree on this because even, even if I agree with you on long-term prospects in a current system, I completely agree with you on short-term. Short-term can be up to 30 years. <laughs> so, like, Trump can definitely, if he can get Congress to do it, um, or if he can use executive orders to do it, he can definitely do this. It's a matter of whether or not he can get his own party to play along. But if they do, then yeah, the Democrats are going to have every talking point they themselves have spread stolen from them. Absolutely. And they're going to have nothing to show for it. All they'll have is their liberal wars and, uh, you know, their, their, their culture wars. That'll be it. And economically, he'll kick their ass. And people got to understand this. And the other thing as well is that, he, you know, Trump said, I remember reading it, I don't know when he said it, the plan is in three or four years time, the Republican Party to be a workers party. That's the scariest thing that anybody. Yeah, he also said that, uh, that he, he had his men come in and tell Congress, you aren't the party of Reagan anymore. I think that he'll be able to get Congress, certainly Republican Congress around the side, because remember, all these all these congressmen represent usually different parts of capital, whether they're financial this or oil that. And if he's going to do MMT, he's going to be able to pick and choose the winners. He'll be able to say to Koch brothers, I'll give you all this. He'll say to these other right. boys in Wall Street, I'll give you all this. And away you go. And they all agree with him. And we'll have a change in how capitalism works by the major proponent of capitalism who controls the system. And we'll see what happens across as, as their effects. I don't know how their effects will go across the rest of the world, but it's very interesting. Well, very scary, to be honest with you. Well, I mean, I, I think we're in a moment where everyone's, okay, and, and you know, our, our great hair logical debate being somewhat over because we've come to a temporary consensus on this. Because I can grant you, like I said, I'll, I'll grant you that one, even if I think MMT is dangerous, which I do, um, two, and I think it doesn't really have a, a theory of international money, but Trump can definitely use something like it to increase productive capacity for 30, 40 years. I mean, this could be a long-term legacy. And when you look at the way the Democrats have not done this, one of the things that Trump is, is, is going to do for sure, I'm almost certain because the Republicans agree with it, is to start looking at printing more money, which I don't agree with, but Republicans have always done it, and two, to remove the monopoly protections from medicine in the United States. Yeah, he's discussed that. Yeah, and I think they're going to do it because I think that the Republicans can't can't actually, for their own base, can't can't support that kind of trust. That'll drop pro medical prices in the United States dramatically, and and then it wouldn't take like it just takes a little bit of injection of currency to keep it going. And and hell, they could do it. And and in this sense, you're right. They could do it with tax rebates. It'll favor the rich, the rich. But yeah, they could totally do it. It'll be it'll be you know Keynesianism for the rich. <laughs> it won't be neoliberalism, though. And this is why, this is why I'm so – I still have people who are insisting that Trump is going to work like a neoliberal Republican. And I'm like, what are you – what are you on? You know, he might get boxed in. That's the other thing. You know, who knows? He might get boxed in. Yeah, but it won't be by, it won't be by the left. Like, He'd be boxed in by the corporations and by the military. That's who right. he'd be boxed in by. I, I, I think, right, and I actually think in the United States, the military and the corporations don't exactly have the same interests. No, and, uh, and the CIA, and, you know, there's lots of these. I think the military are fine with military Keynesianism, you know, but maybe the, the corporations aren't. Right, and the, CIA, and the CIA seems weird. I, I'm actually trying to figure out what the CIA's game plan is. Because they didn't seem to want to reverse the verdict, but they did seem to want to delegitimize them. The reason why I said they didn't seem to want to reverse the verdict is they, they decided in, pre, in joint with Obama not to release all the reports to the electors in the Electoral College. You, you know, when you start getting into geopolitics stuff, I'm watching liberals and even left like cheer this on. I'm like, that's hard. Yeah, but it's much easier for them just to kill him, to assassinate him, I think, after he takes office. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm deadly serious. I think it's much better because one is a constitutional crisis and then the other is you just, you off him. And that's a message to anybody who else tries to do it, you know. So, uh, yeah, so, but I, I don't understand, Derek, because we, we seem to have agreed so much on the money. What is it that you still don't kind of agree with my view on? Why do you think it can't work forever? Well, for two reasons we just discussed. One, we, the competition to, between nations is destabilizing. Two, 
there's natural resource limits. Anytime there's a research hiccup, but I mean, like, if you look at what caused stagflation, this is, this is where, this kind of supports your view and my view simultaneously. The reason why that only lasted about 30 years was not because the policy doesn't work, is that the policy is fragile. So the moment you have any sort of resource constraints imposed by either political or natural reasons, things start reading really messy pretty quickly. Now, they can renormalize, you know, after a crisis, but it would be, it would cause a crisis. Now, I do agree that this seems like it could mitigate the business cycle to some degree within a particular, within a country. I am less convinced of how it works internationally in our current system. But I also have said, and I've said this to, not to you, that I've had, I've had nobody give me a good theory of the way international money currently works. And I'm going to cite an mmt -er actually, for this. Michael Hudson has said that this is a gaping flaw in MMT that dra dramatically needs to be fixed, is a theory of international money, which to me, the reason why they can't do it is because they don't have a good value theory. But because, you know, you, you, are, you are adding things to MMT. Me, personally. Yeah, well... Like what? Because you assume value theory. You oh, assume value theory. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, you know... Right, absolutely. most Keynesians don't. I know they don't, but like, you know, the probably the probably the problem with them is that they don't, you know, I think you could make it probably pretty coherent if you choose value theory, you know, right. literally, and, and because they, they, that, that explains, you know, value theory explains the relative strength of those currencies. And so when I'm saying you can't believe in MMT and Marxism, I'm not saying that like 80 to 90 percent of what MMT isn't true. In fact, hell, Jehu, who's a gold bug Marxist, agrees that the two key assumptions of MMT are correct. That there's the art currency, that it is not, and there is no need for it to be convertible. And his problem with it is the same, pro his answer to it, is, I think, is kind of ludicrous. But his problem with it is the same problem I have with it, and that's when you start dealing with international markets. I think value theory mitigates that, but it still needs to be thought out more. And you and I both hit that's where we both hit a wall i had to concede like, i was conceding and conceding and conceding until we hit that yeah I, I think the like we both totally agree that the problem is like when you there's one definite problems when you hit resource limits you know you're just going to hit inflation very quickly and right and then the other the other one then is let's say you have an inflationary crisis like that it's affecting one country more than another how stable is all of these countries using mmt what would they actually try and go to do that's and know, it would vary from country to country and it would throw off the international trade market well like, yeah no it, it could yeah like it would or they would all stick to mmt or would they find an advantage in going to different one i don't i don't know like the thing is though that you know the problem there's another problem with mmt that the only person that really discusses it well that i've come across is kletsky He's got a famous paper on it. Okay. And basically his his thing is, says that, well, you know, the capitalists are interested in profit. They definitely are. But they're they're also interested in power. If you have a proper full MMT thing running and you got everybody guaranteed job if they want it, that the power relation between the capitalist and the employee, it gets kind of messed up. Yeah, because 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 labor is labor's elastic. They can walk and get a different job somewhere else, you know? labor does what it wants then to a certain extent and that that tension will always be there in a capitalist mmt system you know that's essentially that was the main reason why neoliberals i think you know really went for right. their particular solution to the inflation crisis because you know they didn't want these up the unions having so much power but you know so like there is these tensions whether it can hold but the thing is that well i've never i've never actually said that you were wrong about it working in the short to even medium term like if you look at so like that is definitely something for mmtiers and including myself to think about whether what happens in the crisis and i think that koletsky's problem there might be the seed that causes it to revert back to the other one the thing with this mmt stuff is like you know who knows capitalism probably won't last another hundred years we'll all be dead on a frying planet but it, it could be a maybe this switch between mmt type policies and non-mmt type policies might be one of these long scale chondratia flips that's endemic to the system well actually i actually i, I kind of thought 
I have no proof of this. All right, because I'm not this. I, I am a lay economist. I'm not a professional economist, and no professional economist has even tried this. But I, I suspect that if we did look at Contradio scales and we looked at national policies, we might actually see the flips. And that has to do with the masking of class dynamic. And again, this is where Marxism, even if you modify it with MMT, is still superior to straight MMT because um, straight MMT doesn't deal with classes at all. I, I don't see where it does. And, it, it, you know, there's other laws of motion going on. But, okay, so let's, let's, let's go ahead and cut to what, you know, our consensus here, what we agree, what we, I think we agree more than we don't. And so you aren't a heretic, I take it. I think we agree, to be honest with you. I think that, you know, your, your point is valid about what happens in the crisis. Right. And what would trigger a crisis would be either international currency markets generally in response to a natural disaster. Yeah, some kind of inflationary, inflationary problem, oil or gas or whatever the hell. We run out of oil, we run out of gas, we run out of lithium, we run out of bronze, any number of things can do it. So we got that. We also agree against certain other Marxists that, the, that Marxist logic doesn't just account for gold. Because if it, if, if, if it does, like certain people say, uh, Ernest Mandel, a lot of Trotskyist, then it's objectively wrong. Yeah, like I, I'm not enough of a Marxist to know whether Marx totally goes with gold or not. If he does totally go with gold, he's wrong. But I, 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 and if he, that doesn't, to me, that's not really even a problem because, you know, it's on the edges of his theory. And also, it's like, you know, so what if the guy didn't get everything right, you know? Right. Well, I mean, I, I actually think it's pretty clear that he thought that money could be other things than gold. So do I. I think I think I've read it in places and I can't find it. He certainly talked about different types of peasant currencies in Russia or something like this. So he talks about talks about that. He talks about gold's lack of value in the Americas in the economic manuscripts of 1844. And then he talks about credit money being increasingly divorced from commo from direct commodities in volume three. So, I mean, I don't think like when I was reading, I was reading a lot of Marxist theories of money. And I realized Marxists don't agree on shit here. They really don't. But I do think if you look at the credit money and think about the three functions of money, there's no reason why a commodity fetish, because all this is still tied to the production of commodities, necessitates it being a physical commodity. In fact, after, after a while, that would be a problem because speculation would make it unstable and it would eventually physically run out. So the second thing we agree on is that the people who say that neoliberalization is the only way capitalism can fix that kind of crisis, are basically just wrong. Yes. Right? We, we agree that all the, essential, all the essential elements of capitalism, class, class stratification and abstract value, can be maintained in ways that it's probably some ways we haven't even thought of yet. And it's, a, it's very limiting of us. And certainly on the Marxist left, a lot of people think that, well, it's weird. You've got the failing rate of profit people who think that it had to happen that way. Neoliberalism was just an inevitability. And then you've got the other people who think that neoliberalism was a, a big evil cabal of people who decide just to do it for the sheer fuckery of it. Right, which is nuts. But and it's, it's actually some kind of combination of the two. Well, I, I would agree. Yes, people want power. But I, I actually don't think... Like, this is where like different sectors of capital and all that act very differently. I mean... It's much harder to generalize what capitalists want than I think Marxists tend to really want to do. Absolutely. It's no coincidence that Donald Trump, as a real estate guy, is coming in with MMT stuff. Right. Because he doesn't do foreign trade, as opposed to, like, car manufacturers or whatever. Exactly. Right, right. who do deal in foreign trade are, are financial people whose whole purpose is to distort the relationships in foreign trade. So yeah, no, that that's crucial. And um, if if Marxists still did decent class analysis, we'd see that. I mean, I, I've said this for years. Like, you start seeing people coming in from real estate or from the military, they're not going to act in a neoliberal way. Uh, I, I like to point out that Pinochet didn't, of all people. I mean, even though he's credited, you know, from the shock treatment and all that and killing socialism, but he actually did not cut the welfare nets and stuff and institute hard austerity policies in his own country that actually happened later. I, I think a lot of Marxists want to believe that because they don't want to believe the right is actually a threat. And a lot of them 
a lot of them in fighting political determinism, okay, want to also like be economists, which is also an error. Uh, economistic, which is an error. Like economism is considered, uh, in classical Marxism, is considered an error. You, you veer too far one way or the other, you're going to have a problem. Like one of the main reasons I did this podcast, little would you know it, like by I think some of your questions of it, like I think there's a a big gap in Marxist understanding and say you could say the opposite way, MMT understanding by obviously not including Marxist theory of value in there. But there's something very much missing for me, like in understanding the state, the power of the state to create currency and the impact that has on on being able to forestall profit crises or whatever there's just a, a a big gaping hole there for me and i think that one thing like if anybody's listened to this who's interested in doing work on this i think there's lots of work to be done like i said i don't i i don't think anybody in their own school in a pure sense has come up with a convincing theory of international trade there's no marxist who who's, has an answer for me on stuff like well why did the petrodollar happen if it's all just about extraction commodity and it has to be gold. Like, and why does it actually have to be gold? I don't actually see where you get that from Marx's overall writing. I can see where you get it from reading Capital Volume 1 and maybe Capital Volume 2. But if you read everything, I don't think you can say that. And the other thing is, like, I think we've got to understand when Marx is writing Volume 1 and Volume 2, like, you've got to think about who he's actually attacking. Right. You know, he's basically taking on Adam Smith and these guys. And they all were commodity money guys. So Marx was kind of attacking them from their from their own point of view, right? I mean, he's not dealing with neo chartalism or Francis Jalutism. He's dealing with something very specific to Britain in a very specific time, even which is the seventeen, like his his whole thing is the time period of Adam Smith up to his own day. And Marxists have a bad habit of pretending that the the economic analysis and class analysis stops when Marx or Lenin or whoever they particularly like the most stopped writing. I mean, it's a that's a serious problem. I, it's one of the reasons why I like the work of Andrew Kleiman in that, and even in some ways don't like the work of Paul Sweezy, even though I disagree with it, because they didn't just assume that you could proof text Marx and just win. You actually had to look at some empirical things. Now, how they got their data and how they justified it were different, but that's a different podcast well i think we've bit the arse on this dog i think in, in short i take back you're not a heretic if you told me that you thought mnt was a good thing i was gonna have to kick you out of the communist movement <laughs> by fiat <laughs> by fiat <laughs> yeah it's like uh by ex cathedra just like as pope of marxism you are gone but <laughs> your ego's getting out of hand here Derek. <laughs> no I, i'm not marxist pope um, we don't have a Marxist. Oh, maybe we need a Marxist pope. I don't know. What we need, you know, what uh, we need is a Church of Marx. I've often thought this. Seriously, <laughs> Church of Marx. Absolutely. I'm in London here, right? And there's living in in a place where it's got a lot of African, Caribbean, you know, Somali people living, and like there, well, a lot. Most Somalis are 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 Muslim, I think. But there's an awful lot of like small little churches all around me. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And all these people are going off, are going off to church every Sunday, putting in loads of work and dressing up and singing. Can you imagine if everybody just went off to like some kind of, you know, atheist church of Marx or something <laughs> where we recited yeah. some working class stuff every Sunday and we went, yeah, woo. And then we all went off home. Imagine how different the world would be. If people put the same effort into like actual the reality of their lives instead of some <laughs> non-existent hopery, g g give t give ten percent to the dual power tithe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've actually thought about this too because I w I have thought, man, a lot of what we need to do would be a lot easier if we were a religion <laughs> and didn't just act like a religion, but also had its protected status. <laughs> It's true. Like you could actually, is it the pirate party or is, are they set up as yeah. religion? Some of those guys are set up as religions in Sweden. Uh, I know the Jedis are set up as a religion legitimately somehow. Yeah. Like, so, so you know, it's actually, you know, but there the are dumber religions. They are they, <laughs> <laughs> just about, they would, uh, the thing is they would, uh, they would make it illegal though, straight away. They would change the law. That's the only problem. <laughs> 
<laughs> we, we, you know, we think we have them now. We have them. And they go, nah, we no, figured we just, it out. No, we, we just, just changed did. the law. <laughs> you guys are excluded. Yeah. You obviously don't understand, Marx. We've changed the law. <laughs> yeah, too bad. All right. Well, signing off from the from Egypt and the the high, the the holy sea of Marxism. Um, I'm bowing here. You can't see it, Derek, but I'm bowing. I'm prostrating, prostrating myself. You are unamathematized. You are no longer a heretic. We still have to combat the MMTers, even if they're right about some things. <laughs>